Welcome to Society Steps, a series of episodes with people around the world who are creating positive change and social impact. I am Luis Guilherme and our guest today is Aisha Farvin, who is joining us from Singapore. Aisha is an epidemiologist and public health researcher at the National University of Singapore, where she is currently pursuing her PhD. Aisha earned her bachelor degree in biological studies from the Nanyang Technological University and the Master of Public Health from the National University of Singapore. Aisha is interested in investigating the health disparities in vulnerable populations in the community. She has writing on the influence of social inequities and systemic determinants on the health and well-being of low-wage migrant workers in Singapore. So, let's listen about the various components of Aisha's work and especially understand what epidemiologists do during a pandemic. A spoiler. Work in this field requires not only a knowledge of biology, but also social sciences, mathematics, data science, and more. Thank you so much, Aisha, for your time. We are here connected in quite different time zones. It's morning in Brazil and night in Singapore. Also, I deeply appreciate your attention. I, I imagine every epidemiologist and public health research in the world is working hard in the past two years. So it's an honor to have this opportunity to talk to you about your great career. So Aisha, uh, could you introduce yourself? Um, thank you, Louis, and thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Um, it's a pleasure to have this conversation with you. Um, my name is Aisha Farin, and I am from Singapore. So, um, and I work as an epidemiologist and um, public health researcher at the Saucy Hop School of Singapore. So, um, um, it is currently nighttime in, in Singapore, but um, as an epidemiology, we are used to working long hours, um, especially for the past year or so, um, we've been trying to contain um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, in the community. And um, as for me, I mainly focus on um, pandemic preparedness for the migrant worker population in Singapore, who are um, one of the um, underserved populations. And these group of um, migrant workers don't have adequate access to healthcare. And um, over the course of the pandemic, um, the migrant workers in Singapore were actually the ones who were um, disproportionately affected by COVID-19. So about um, 91% of our total number of cases were actually made up of these low-wage uh, migrant workers living in their dormitories. So um, I had an opportunity to work um, with the migrant worker population in um, helping them in a way build up adequate information access and also help them to have adequate access to healthcare through um, raising awareness and also through the research that I'm currently focusing on, which um, aims to improve um, health literacy and self-efficacy among migrant workers. So yeah, I look forward to sharing more about my work with you. And again, yes, thanks for having me. So Aisha, how did you become interested in researching and working as an epidemiologist and public health researcher? I was actually originally trained in biological sciences. So I studied um, biological sciences and I actually carried out um, biomedical research. Um, however, it was actually a very interesting journey for me to make the switch from lab-based biomedical science to public health. And um, one of the things I was always interested in and passionate about was using research to drive um, positive social change. And I wanted to utilize my skill sets um, in solving some of the problems that I witnessed that was persistent in the community. So I was first exposed to um, social vulnerabilities that people faced when I volunteered overseas in the regional countries with um, the Singapore International Foundation, which is a non-profit organization that actually focused on capacity building in regional countries like Cambodia, Vietnam, and Indonesia. So um, I went on multiple trips to these countries, uh, mainly to do um, to build water and sanitation facilities and to educate villagers about 
um, public health as, as well as um, feminine hygiene. So uh, my motivation or impetus to actually pursue public health and epi came when I went on these trips. And there I actually witnessed a lot of um, villagers having no access to clean water and some of them had no access to healthcare facilities at all. And many of the children in these villages also had suffered from malnutrition and diarrheal diseases because they were consuming contaminated water, but they were not able to get um, healthcare or medical services um, in a timely manner because all the hospitals were in the cities. And I saw parents with sick children um, queuing overnight outside hospitals just to get their children treated. And at the same time, I also became very interested in infectious diseases, particularly how they spread and they disproportionately affected um, vulnerable populations like uh, the, the poor and migrant workers and, and you know, the elderly. So, and I realized that there was actually a lack of information um, from these populations. And also there was, wasn't any research that was being done with these groups as well. So it was very difficult to actually know what were the needs of these vulnerable groups so that appropriate um, health care or public health interventions could be done. So that actually became my motivation to switch tracks from doing research to pursue epidemiology and public health research. So I was lucky to have um, the opportunity to pursue my master's in public health at the National University of Singapore. And um, that was where I actually got exposed to um, like-minded individuals and was also able to pick up the research skills that I needed to conduct research with vulnerable communities. So currently I focus on a mix of research areas like social determinants of migrant health, um, infectious disease epidemiology and health inequities. And um, I also focus on um, social justice issues. Since the past year, epidemiology has become an increasingly popular field. And by hearing your response, I assume that epidemiologists deal with a wide range of experts and different fields of science every day, biology, social sciences, and more. So what is your routine as an epidemiologist and public health researcher like? And have you already worked in other countries and in Asia or outside Asia? Thank you. So um, a typical day um, as an epidemiologist, at the peak of the outbreak um, last year when I was working at the National Center for Infectious Diseases in Singapore as an epidemiologist. So at the peak of the outbreak, the hours are really long. So I would usually start, some days start as early as um, 6 a.m. in the morning. And that is where we would actually review um, patients who get admitted with COVID-19 and we would prepare a um, list of patients and monitor their status. And then um, after that, we also spend a lot of time um, doing data analysis, reviewing the data, um, looking at um, patient parameters to make sense of the data. Because um, as an epidemiologist, you have to focus on making sense of data and feeding that information to the people who make the decisions, like policymakers. So um, where I worked, I had to actually analyze the data to help inform um, the doctors or the directors about the appropriate measures to take um, and also do um, analysis to figure out how many beds we are going to need in case patients need to be um, watered at the ICU. So there was a significant um, attention paid to data analysis, but um, I also, apart from data analysis, I also divide my time between conducting um, literature reviews. So we do need to read up on ongoing outbreaks around the world because um, infectious diseases, no, no boundaries, um, they can spread anywhere. So there is always a need to keep up the surveillance to know what are the, the pathogens of interest that we constantly need to monitor. So I will do a, a literature reviews on infectious diseases, also read up on research methodologies 
because a uh, part of my time is also spent on doing research and um, conducting surveillance on pathogens of interest um, and making sense of data. So in a day, um, it's usually divided between a lot of um, research online, um, reviewing the literature, reviewing the data that's available. And um, I also do carry out um, public health research with the migrant worker population. So some days um, I would conduct interviews and focus group discussions with migrant workers on the field to understand um, what they are going through, what are the barriers they face in accessing healthcare and preventive health services. And um, even though currently um, based in Singapore, we do have regional collaborators in other countries like Thailand, Malaysia, and Timor. So, um, and these um, we work together on research projects like improving healthcare access to uh, migrant populations in all these countries. So, um, we do spend a lot of time collaborating. Um, across borders as well. And what I actually enjoy um, about being an epidemiologist and a public health researcher is that the work constantly evolves. So um, no two days are the same. So there is always something new that I get to learn. There are always um, new things to follow up on. So um, that that is the part that I really enjoy about my job. It offers a lot of opportunities to learn new things and also to to meet people and um, to collaborate together. We are Wayne Shades Curious. As you have to deal with a huge amount of data, I may say that epidemiologists and public health researchers are great data scientists or data analysts as well. <laughs> and your field is surprisingly similar to my studies as an environmental sociologist. Uh, we also have to understand different cultures, for example. And I can see several bridges between your areas. And speaking of what, what we do and your routines, Aisha, what are the joys and pains of being an epidemiologist and public health researcher in Singapore? And what do you like and the most challenging things about working in these careers? Um, I have always kind of likened um, being an epidemiologist in a way to chasing chaos. So it's a lot of um, just everything can go wrong. Um, when you have outbreaks or pandemics, um, it is a very stressful situation. It's very chaotic. And um, your main purpose as an epidemiologist is to basically um, protect people from getting infected and to also make sense of the data to inform policymakers to put in place appropriate measures to prevent the disease from spreading and making sense of what's going on. So... Um, one of the things that I love about the job is that it does train you to keep calm and level-headed in any situation. So um, even though it can be, there's a lot of uncertainty and anything can go wrong, um, you are expected or people expect you to make sense of whatever's going on and to keep calm to actually inform decisions. So... Um, it's not an easy job because you are um, facing an invisible enemy, like a pathogen all the time. Um, so it does get stressful because it feels like a race against time. So you're basically chasing after an invisible enemy and trying to make sense of what it, what's going to happen next and you know where is the, the trajectory going to go. So um, that is something that adds a lot of stress to you, but um, what I actually love about it is that the, the adrenaline rush, it is energizing. So, and it, you, um, it actually, it is extremely stressful and the hours are long, but it is rewarding because at the end of the day, I always feel that um, I've done my best and I have made sense of the data I've actually like, provided information to help put in measures to protect people. So in a way, it is about providing evidence-based solutions to influence decisions. So that's something that I really enjoy. Of course, as a challenge, um, it's constantly evolving. I do feel the need to keep up with um, you know, the changes and some of these the situations can change in a second. So... Um, 
there are times where um, situations or handling pandemics, it can get overwhelming. But um, as I, but then I have, or at least I work with a very um, supportive group of colleagues and teammates who, you know, we support one another. And I guess um, as working together as a team also makes it much better as an epidemiologist and uh, it actually helps you to cope with the stresses that come with the job. And yeah, so um, that's what I actually love about working in this um, field. Well, I guess the COVID-19 represents a unique change in everybody's routine. I am also a lawyer and I, I began to work from home, for example. Well, uh, as you are working in the front line of defense against the pandemic, has the COVID-19 changed your work and academic routine? If so, may you describe what has changed? Yeah, the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, um, by now we know it changed everything, our life as we know it. So in Singapore, um, what changed was that um, we had to go into a lockdown when um, the number of infections actually started peaking in April uh, last year. And um, there was a huge outbreak in the migrant population, in the uh, low-wage migrant workers who were actually living in dormitories, which were um, heavily congested. So it made um, conditions easy for the COVID-19 for COVID-19 to spread. Uh, and because of the lockdown, um, we had to work from home. So um, because of that um, lockdown, a lot of academically, a lot of um, my research projects were affected, and um, some of I was working on. Um, a project to actually understand the profile of low-wage migrant workers in Singapore and the health, health status of these workers. Uh, but because there were large-scale outbreaks ongoing in the dormitories where the migrant workers resided in, um, the lockdown made it impossible to actually reach these workers. So there was um, a lot of barriers to reaching them and we were unable to conduct any of our ongoing research with them. And um, so we had to put some of these research projects on hold. And at the same time, the COVID-19 pandemic also brought to light the inequalities that these workers encountered. So because we had we were under lockdown, um, people were not allowed to go out um, other than for essential services and only essential workers like those working in healthcare um, were actually allowed to go to work. So um, it actually affected uh, people's access to services and for the migrant workers, they were actually trapped in the dormitories and a lot of the, the small scale dormitories, um, they did not actually have enough access to essential items like food or even, um, you know, healthcare. So there was a lot of scrambling. It led to a lot of scrambling and containment measures to prevent um, further spread. So, um, and during that period of time, there was um, always a need to make sure that the people in the in lockdown who had no access to essential services were supported. So there were a lot of ground up initiatives to um, support people like migrant workers, as well as the elderly um, in Singapore, who are usually not that mobile. So um, we had to scramble, put in place measures to support these groups. And academically, um, the most challenging part during COVID was to put aside some of um, the projects that we knew were actually very useful to the population that we were working to focus on COVID-19. So a lot of attention was actually diverted from um, non-COVID projects and uh, we just channeled all the resources into COVID-19 and making sure how we can better make sense of um, what's going on to actually address the issues and the barriers that vulnerable populations faced in accessing um, healthcare and other rights. What is the biggest myth and misconception about your work and within our area of expertise like migration? I think I would um, 
in general, I would I wouldn't call it a misconception, but usually people um, epidemiologists do not usually get a lot of attention um, because a lot of us work in the background um, trying to make sense of data, carrying out surveillance and research. And there are actually many areas that epidemiologists work in. So there is this misconception that epidemiologists usually uh, just work in hospitals, but um, we work in many different fields. Some work in hospitals as clinical epidemiologists to track hospital-acquired um, infections, while some work in um, the field to set up surveillance systems and collect primary data, like interviewing people or collecting um, data on the ground. And some epidemiologists, um, most of us also do outbreak investigations. So in times like COVID, that's where we come in to investigate outbreaks and do contact tracing. But um, I feel that a lot of times it's actually hard for people to understand exactly what we do. Um, but the current pandemic situation actually helped to a certain degree um, in highlighting the importance of epidemiology and the work that epidemiologists do. And as for my area of expertise, I focus on migrant health issues, which in Singapore, um, it is actually um, not very common um, because uh, migrant health issues have uh, personally, I feel that migrant health issues had um, always been neglected because um, low-wage migrant workers in Singapore, they're actually considered as transient uh, populations who only come to Singapore to work. And then um, after um, a certain period of time, migrant workers usually go back to their own countries um, once their work permit expires or if their employers choose not to renew their employers. So... Um, before COVID, um, COVID-19 um, happened, migrant health and issues um, that were prevalent in the migrant worker populations did not actually garner any attention. However, um, the pandemic shows that uh, actually showed us that the weakest link in Singapore was actually the, the migrant population because they have long been uh, neglected by the system. So they have inadequate access to um, healthcare. They face barriers in seeking healthcare. So um, there wasn't, um, so if they want to actually seek healthcare, they actually had to get their employer's permission to even go and see a doctor. And if the employer doesn't want to pay for their medical fees, even though it's legally obligated, the employers are legally mandated to cover the healthcare uh, costs of their workers. But if they don't want to, um, a migrant worker is not able to freely get the healthcare he needs. So, and um, apart from healthcare, there were also issues about living conditions because a lot of the migrant workers stay in um, dormitories, which are um, huge, and um, they actually share a room with many other workers. So that leads to very congested conditions. So a lot of these conditions attributed to the ease of COVID-19 spread in the dormitories when we had the large-scale outbreak last year. But before the outbreak, uh, migrant health issues and the health inequities that they faced wasn't um, addressed actively. So um, in a way, uh, the pandemic did help um, us you know, get the attention that this issue needs. But it also means that for me and the area of expertise that I choose to focus on, it's not very common. Yeah, it's not very common. So um, in a way, this area that I'm focusing on, social determinants of health in the migrant population is relatively um, new in Singapore as, as research goes. Um, however, there are um, people who do pursue um, this area. There are um, researchers who do work on migrant health issues, but um, in terms of the importance, uh, the area that I'm focusing on is relatively new. 
It's insightful to hear your perspective from Singapore. Um, so in Brazilians, a strong belief that the problems you describe it, it's just an issue that you can find in developing countries like Brazil, Thailand, or the Philippines. And Aisha, well, um, several scientists point out that climate change can facilitate zoonotic spillovers. In addition, some experts are warning we are entering an era of pandemics. How are the epidemiologists uh, preparing themselves for the following years? As um, epidemiologists, we, also, we always know that when it comes to a pathogen or an infectious disease, it's always a matter of when the pathogen is going to spill over and infect, start infecting humans. And we're actually seeing this in the recent years. Uh, there's been increasing um, incidence of uh, viruses spilling over into the community infecting humans and we also see it with the SARS-CoV-2 and um, other pathogens. So, and one of the reasons, like you mentioned, the climate change and also deforestation plays a huge role as we humans start encroaching into uh, animal territories. We do increasingly come in contact with animals that may be reservoirs or holes for um, pathogens. And the more we actually encroach into territories, um, we do put ourselves into increasing risk of exposure to pathogens like SARS-CoV-2. Um, so the best way that um, to actually prepare for these zoonotic spillovers, which you mentioned, um, it is going to increasingly happen in the future. Because um, humans, as humans, you know, we are constantly just encroaching into the territories of animals. So it's only a matter of time where we get another outbreak. But the best way for us to prepare for these spillovers is to set up surveillance systems and to also strengthen the capacity of our health system to handle outbreaks. So um, firstly, surveillance is very important because we need to identify or we need to know whether an outbreak is going on. So if there is actually... Um, no surveillance systems in place to see if more people are falling ill out of the ordinary or if a particular disease is actually causing people to fall more severely ill and requiring hospitalization. So if we do not track these patterns, we would actually not know um, whether there is something um, like an outbreak going on. So a lot of the countries, um, they are actually focusing on strengthening existing surveillance systems. And, uh, and COVID-19 has also showed us how important that is, you know, to be able to track how the pathogen mutates, to track the numbers so that we are better ready to, to deal with um, the outbreak. And it's also important to prepare for future spillovers by um, strengthening your lab capacity. And that is something that, I really want to emphasize because boosting lab capacity and also infrastructure, healthcare and laboratory infrastructure is very important because it helps to do testing in a much faster time. So um, during COVID, a lot of countries, developing countries, without um, you know, adequate lab um, capacity, it's very hard to actually um, test your samples to confirm whether or not a person has COVID-19. And this actually puts or delays a person getting uh, or a patient getting the appropriate treatment they need. So um, capacity building is very important, both by building your healthcare infrastructure, but it's also important to increase, let's say, your number of ICU beds. It's also important to train healthcare professionals for outbreaks, um, which um, to me, I feel that um, there is a, a lack of focus or not insufficient focus on pandemic preparedness plans. Not all countries actually have a preparedness plan that um, allows them to quickly put in place um, measures or activate uh, manpower and the resources needed when an outbreak breaks out. Um, so it is actually important. The pandemic plans are crucial to ensure that public systems or public health systems are warmed up to deal with the next outbreak. So um, 
we need to actually keep um, ourselves prepared and we also do need to make sure that our healthcare system is sufficiently equipped to handle the next outbreak, um, either by running pandemic tabletop exercises, which not a lot of countries do, because people always tend to think that outbreaks don't happen. Um, you know, in actual fact, it's only a matter of when outbreaks happen, when the next pathogen spills over. So it's very important um, for scientists as well as for um, healthcare professionals and also political um, people in politics, people in governments need to recognize the need to focus on strengthening health systems and to focus on pandemic preparedness. In the past year, in December, I read a study carried out by some researchers from the University of Sydney, India, United Kingdom, and if I'm not mistaken, Kenya as well. And they mentioned some cities where the next pandemic may start. And most of these cities are located in the north region of Brazil, close to Peru and Colombia, sub-Saharan Africa, and Southeast Asia. And investigators wrote that these places face a serious problem when, when it comes to deforestation, lack of sanitation, uh, their health system, and other issues. Well, Aisha, you also mentioned that surveillance. We are also in the area of artificial intelligence. So when you say surveillance, are you referring to artificial intelligence? or new software, a new software to better analyze data. And in this context, artificial intelligence is helping you in your work? Actually, for surveillance, I was referring to very simple forms of surveillance, um, like just tracking the numbers, um, you know, the number of cases that are happening, the locations that they are happening, and also mapping uh, where... Uh, for instance, if there is an outbreak, for actually mapping where the outbreaks happen. So a lot of it is actually, um, you know, tracking numbers and um, trying to detect uh, where the infection or the outbreak could have come from. But um, there is a lot of um, new technology and artificial intelligence being developed. And I think in the current pandemic, um, a lot of countries are actually using artificial intelligence and uh, advanced technology to do contact tracing. Even for Singapore, it's very interesting that we actually use um, an application, a mobile application um, called Trace Together and Safe Entry. Uh, the government calls it Safe Entry, where we have to scan to uh, whenever we enter um, buildings or malls or restaurants, anywhere that we go, we have to use this app to actually enter check-in and check-out. So the purpose of this technology is to um, do contact tracing more easily. And this data that is collected, it uses Bluetooth technology. So it makes it very easy for the Ministry of Health in Singapore. If uh, a person becomes a COVID-19 uh, positive, then um, it actually allows the government to extract data from the mobile devices um, through this app to see where this person has been to. And it helps them in actually identifying the close contacts. And there are also a lot of um, artificial intelligence also used to like map or model how outbreaks are gonna spread and also do modeling of the resources that we are going to need, like the number of ICU beds. So technology is increasingly playing a huge part in surveillance. And, or I would say it has contributed to um, certain countries engaging in heavy surveillance. So we are uh, in Singapore, we are actually heavily surveilled because of COVID-19 using um, technology. Yes, it's a it's a different perspective here in Brazil and some Western countries. Um, we since the since the past year we have a long discussion about how the government is using your data. And well, in parallel, I read that in some Asian countries like South Korea, they have this concern, but the population apparently is more okay with that. And uh, during pandemics, we can see the importance of effective public health policy. What is the importance of epidemiologists in, in public health care services? I would um, say that epidemiology is 
one of the cornerstones of public health because um, we do study patterns of disease and um, you know for you to uh, uncover trends and to identify risk factors um, it's very important to actually put in place appropriate interventions um, so in that way, knowing the epidemiology or studying the epidemiology of a disease is important to actually know what needs to be done, what are the trends, so we can actually guide policymakers and healthcare professionals to make um, evidence-based decisions to and protect the health and well-being of individuals. So in that sense, um, epidemiology is, is crucial in uncovering these patterns and making sure that uh, the decisions that we are making are actually guided by the evidence that is available from um, tracking the disease and studying the disease patterns. Returning to the point where you said the effects of the pandemic are worse for poor people, what is the role of epidemiologists in protecting vulnerable populations? May you describe which problems such populations are facing to access healthcare services in Singapore? I think the role of an epidemiologist is very important, especially for migrant, uh, sorry, vulnerable populations like migrant workers, because um, we help to bridge the lack of data that is available for this population. Because um, traditionally, um, there are no uh, systems or data systems in place to um, study or at least to profile the health of these um, migrant workers in Singapore. So uh, there is not a lot of data available in terms of the prevalence of um, certain diseases in the migrant worker population, for example, the chronic um, disease burden. So um, we don't know what percentage of migrant workers in Singapore suffer from chronic conditions like diabetes or hypertension. And we also do not know um, what are the healthcare needs of these workers um, because there is just no not enough data that is available. So um, I personally feel that um, and as an epidemiologist, I want to bridge this gap um, with through my work with the migrant um, worker population. I do want to generate data to highlight that um, the healthcare needs of migrant workers are urgent and you know there needs to be more focus that um, that should be paid to the migrant worker population, at least in improving their access to health care. And as for some of the problems that the migrant population in Singapore faces, um, firstly, um, the employers are actually the ones responsible for taking care of the migrant workers. So by law, the responsibility of providing health care and accommodation is actually transferred to the employers. So the state uh, actually transfers the responsibility to the employers. So the employers bear the cost of providing for health care and accommodation and food for these migrant workers. But what this has created is that it's actually um, created barriers to migrant workers um, seeking health uh, or health care because um, firstly they do not um, if they have to if they want to seek uh, treatment for a condition or if they want to actually um, if they need to get hospitalized or go for outpatient treatments the worker has to get a letter of guarantee from an employer to give him permission to actually seek health care. So that itself is the first barrier because if the worker doesn't get this letter from his employer, he's not able to seek medical care. And secondly, the workers, uh, they are not eligible for subsidized health care. So Singaporeans or locals, they are eligible for subsidized health care. So a lot of the medical costs are heavily subsidized by the government. But migrant workers, they are actually treated as foreigners. So they don't enjoy the same subsidies that the local population does. So as a result, when they go to uh, clinics or when they go to hospitals, they actually face very high out-of-pocket costs. But the average wage of migrant workers is very low. So it can range from $450 a month 
to about $800 on average. So their wages are very low and they are just not able to um, go to clinics to seek medical care because they have to pay out of their pockets. Even though their employers have are legally obligated to pay, but a lot of times um, some employers don't actually pay for the workers' health care. So that is one of the biggest barriers, access to health care. Another issue is also um, some of the employers, they don't actually want their workers to take medical leave. So, and these workers are vulnerable because the employer has the power to terminate their work permits anytime without giving a reasonable explanation. So a lot of the workers, they fear that their employers will actually terminate their work permits if they do take uh, medical leave or if they go to see a doctor and they have to take um, leave to rest and recuperate. So there are these barriers that actually prevents them from seeking uh, medical care in a timely manner. So a lot of the workers, they actually choose to self-medicate which is a huge um, problem. Or some of them, they actually get medication for chronic conditions like diabetes or hypertension from their own countries. So they actually get their families to send them their medication through mail to instead of going to see a doctor in Singapore because it's just too expensive for them to seek health care. So um, these issues, um, what led to that... Um, this issue was actually one of the contributing factors to the pen, um, to the large outbreak in the dormitory population last year because uh, when the workers fall sick or when they had symptoms, they actually chose to self-medicate instead of going to see a doctor immediately. You know, and if they had only done so, they, they would have been treated much faster. But because... Um, there are systemic barriers that literally block them from seeking help care in a timely manner. It led to this explosion of COVID-19 um, in the migrant worker population. Yeah, uh, here uh, in Brazil, we have uh, a different problem. Uh, we have universal health care in Brazil. It's called the Sistema Único de Saúde, or the Unified Health System. I, I imagine we can compare it to the British National Health Services. And even though, and here is the difference, even though immigrants can access health care services for free, they are unaware of their rights to do so. Um, as an immigration lawyer, I already assisted several migrants who who do you know they could get vaccinated for free, for example. Aisha, which books, documentaries, animations and or movies inspire you to work as an epidemiologist and a public health researcher and why? Thank you. Um, yeah, I would say that um, one of the very first books that I read um, on epidemiology or on pandemics that kind of made me want to pursue this field was um, there is a book called Pandemic, Tracking Contagions from e Cholera to Ebola and Beyond. Um, the author is Sonia Shah. So um, she has other books as well. And I loved and I love reading her books because it the book, the first book that I read, a um, pandemic, it made me fascinated with um, pathogens and also the extraordinary ability that these pathogens um, they have to keep evolving to survive, and that is exactly um, what I feel that we are facing. We are actually facing an enemy that keeps evolving itself just so that it's able to survive, and that is very interesting. So. Um, when I first read that book, it just made me fascinated with um, studying pathogens, wanting to know more about you know how these pathogens affect humans, and and how do they spread across countries, and you know they spread rapidly. So um, it this was one book that made me get started on this journey. Um, another book that um, I loved reading. Um, especially when it comes to public health and also a focus on humanitarian aid, was this book called Chasing Chaos by uh, Jessica Alexander. 
So um, she actually wrote about her journey working in humanitarian aid and how she ended up working in different countries and um, witnessing um, conflicts and war zones and how it affected people. And yet um, she also talked about the resilience of that people um, exhibit when it comes to, you know, facing a lot of these issues like crises, wars. So I found that very um, inspiring because um, in a way, I wanted to be a field epidemiologist who works on the ground to be able to address people's needs on the ground and to to build um, better support systems for them. So um, I would say these two books were um, were amazing to read. Um, as for movies, um, again, we there's the movie called Contagion, which again it's it's a really fascinating movie. So um, a lot of times, you know. Um, you do understand uh, all these movies on uh, pandemics, you know, uh, it helps you understand that even a simple pathogen has the ability to actually create a huge outbreak or a pandemic. And we always need to be prepared. So I, that's, um, you know, that was the message that I really liked that this movie brought out. So these are just some of the movies and books that that I enjoyed and that shaped, you know, my journey in into epidemiology. For your listeners, you can find Aisha's recommendations in the description of this episode. <laughs> Still about your listeners, Aisha. Let's imagine we have a listener who wants to start to work, um, to, firstly to, to study and work as an epidemiologist and public health researcher. Which skills, books, and when I say books, I am referring to either academic or fiction, uh, movies, documentaries, would you recommend to that person? I would say um, in terms of um, firstly about skills, um, if someone is interested in pursuing epidemiology, um, I would say having or undertaking a, a course or a, at least even a program or a degree would definitely help. Um, because personally, I came from a lab background. I didn't have much um epidemiology knowledge when I first started. So I took a, a diploma in applied epidemiology first, and then I later on went to pursue a master's in public health. And these programs um, formally helped in equipping me with the skills needed. So learning the data analysis softwares, learning to make sense of data. So this that definitely helped. But um, one other thing that um, also played or helped me in, in my career of getting started with epidemiology was also a lot of online courses. So for those who are not able to actually pursue a formal graduate program or a formal program, there are a lot of online resources, um, short courses that um, you can actually um, take part in. And one of the online um, resources that I personally use is Coursera. There are a lot of um, modules, courses. So I have done a lot of public health and epidemiology courses on Coursera and um, as well as edX. So these are good in giving you a bit of um, more background into epidemiology and public health and also to train you in the skill sets needed. So these are some of the courses that um, if someone's interested, you know, they can go and check out um, for books. Um, one of the, the, the most important book that I always have with me even now is uh, this book called Epidemiology by Leon Goddess. So it gives a very nice overview of the different um, epidemiological study types as well as, um, you know, it teaches you how to um, conduct analysis, how to make sense of data. So this textbook is um, it's also very practical, simple enough to understand and use because it focuses on um, building the practical skills that you need. Um, for those who are more keen towards uh, statistics and data science, there is this other book called Medical Statistics by uh, Michael J. Campbell. So this book, it delves a bit deeper into the types of 
data analysis and statistical analysis that you could do to make sense of um, data. So these books, um, I found them to be very useful in giving you a, a more in-depth understanding of the field and also to build up the skill sets that you need to pursue a career in epidemiology and public health. And again, don't forget to check the description of this episode to check Aisha's recommendations. And my last question for you, Aisha, do you have any final message for those who want to create positive social change? There is a quote that I always remember. Um, it's by Bill Gates. It says, um, don't let complexity stop you and be activists. Um, take on the big inequities and that it will be the most, um, one of the greatest experiences of your lives. So um, this is something that I would actually urge everyone who wants to create positive social change to do. It's never going to be easy to take on the complex issues. There are always going to be barriers um, that you, know, you will come across and uh, it will be a difficult journey. Uh, but the journey itself is incredibly rewarding. So... In a way, that is, um, if you are keen about making a change, I would say read up on it. Try to find like-minded individuals to take on the journey. Because what I've realized is that having a group of like-minded people who care about the same issues as you, it's very important in motivating you whenever you feel down or um, you face um, failures, it's always important to have a support system to, to motivate you to pick yourself up again. So um, these two, the journey itself may be difficult, but I would say I would advise people not to give up, follow your passions, and you will eventually find your voice and that it is a very incredibly rewarding journey to take on these complex issues and to be able to raise awareness to drive a positive social change. Thanks again for joining us today, Aisha. And thank you for listening to this episode. Recommend this podcast for your friends who also are willing to create positive change in society. If you understand Portuguese, don't forget to check Green Steps, my podcast where I speak with leading environmentalists from Brazil. You can find the entire series of episodes on my website, luisglarmanmel.com, whose link I wrote in the description of this episode. Social Steps will return in the next month.